Hello all. In this part, we will look at um, what in GeoTap we did to comply for the GDPR regulations which came in force. And bulk of these developments started in 2017 and I will touch upon particular aspects which have been developed post GDPR as well. Um, but bulk of or say even 70 to 80 percent of what I'm going to cover here is going to be what we developed before that May 25, 2018 deadline uh, to call ourselves as compliant with the GDPR regulations. So many companies at that time used to use a bunch of Excel sheets with a catalog of items and figure out what are the security controls, what are the privacy controls in place. Uh, but we decided to invest in a more product-centric approach, wherein we took all the GDPR regulatory requirements as a sort of how it will look like as a product requirement and started investing on that and built, um, I would say, a reusable tech stack of product, uh, which, which we could uh, reuse for multiple other data pipelines or data-driven products down the line as well. And I will just go over that journey in this particular part of this talk. So, so coming to the requirements of GDPR, if I have to distill the requirements from a more product centricity, um, uh, if I have to look at all the GDPR process and uh, distill it. So largely this is what it falls under. So you need to have a module which can help in managing sensitive data. Uh, how you manage is secondary, but fundamentally you need to identify what's a sensitive data and how exactly you're going to manage it. A management could be as simple as, okay, I am going to blacklist all sensitive data. If it's a healthcare data of a personal, I'm going to not even take it into my system. So those are rules. We'll talk about the rules and actions, but that sensitive data management is the first and foremost thing. Then we covered a lot about consent in the previous uh, part. So the consent management becomes, um, I would say, very, very fundamental in terms of uh, compliance for GDPR. Then how do you manage the personally identifiable information? So it could be something as direct as your social security number or your email and phone number or something which could be uh, I, I, I would say implicitly referred based on a bunch of other criteria, right? So it, it could be your uh, IP address and your device identifier and your mobile identifier together, which acts as a PIA for a particular personnel. The next is the user information. So you need a specific entity to manage the whole user information. So suppose the user is, of course, stitched to identifier and GDPR talks about a bunch of user rights in terms of user asking himself to be deleted from the system or asking us, what is the data you have about me? Give it to me in the next 24 hours. These kind of rights are available and they can download all this data and they can, they can ask it to be ported. So to serve all these rights, you need to manage your users, the end users information. Then access management um, is another product uh, identification which we did which is not as i mentioned it is not explicitly talked about in gdpr but we wanted this uh, because if you have to go for the downstream audit and all these things you need to have a clear access management policies of who's accessing your data then the auditing requirements then we had identified based on our data as a service business we had identified um, a couple of um, additional requirements which could help us in privacy. So, for example, in privacy, um, now it is much more formalized. There is something called re-identifiability. And if you, if you use multiple cohorts of various kinds of data, you can re-identify that to a particular person. So, we wanted to minimize that uh, risk. So, we set up something like a cohort minimum size on which the data can be pushed out of the system. And obviously, the data retention is worked out by the TTL. Um, say, for example, if you're collecting cookies as identifier, it has some kind of TTL which you need to adhere to. And the user himself can give a guidance saying that don't, don't return my data beyond 90 days. So which is something we need to comply to. And from a security perspective, uh, the obvious items, which is like that. When do you use your one-way hashes? When do you use your SHA-22 or MD5? And what are the encryption semantics you need to have in place? So these are all requirements. You need to have modules which could uh, potentially do it in the client side or in your server side or while you're pushing it downstream as per the downstream system requirements. 
then as i mentioned if you are going to have a existing set of historical data assets if you need to make it compliance ready you always need to invest on something called a one time cleanup of the data so you would have identified multiple things based on the seven eight line line items which i have listed in the past but if you have to clean up your existing data set that itself is a process on its own you need to run your existing data sets to the clean up process once based on all these requirements so from the product requirements the conceptual model la um nicely divided into three particular layers one is you needed a set of policy and whatever i am showcasing in the blue box becomes a first class citizen in your technical architecture or you would call them as entities or what what do they operate on so you have the rules layer which is actually going to govern the things of what is going to happen then you have the processing layer which can be reused across multiple data pipelines then you have the logical layer which is actually having the data asset in various formats so you have the plain data asset you have the user data asset then you have the audit assets then you have the consent asset so these all become these logical entities become like a first class citizen then the processing entities the deletion compliance processor ttl processor all become first class entities then the policies you need to uh, if 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 tomorrow say something changes some some law changes you need to accordingly have a system where you could extend or morph your policy to adhere to that so this is how it was conceptually segregated and we'll see from a tech perspective how these all play together so coming to the technology end of things this is going to be a more of a bottom ups approach of presentation where i'll talk about a couple of individual bits where we invested in and what was developed and go to a final uh, you could call it as a reference architecture it's a, it's a pretty little old but it still holds good so this was a reference architecture or the architecture which which was developed in 2018 but it still holds good so we'll start from the bottom different components and build it to the co final combined architecture another thing is i am going to cover the data as a service first because that is where we invested in then in the next part or say in in the following this thing i'll cover how what changes we had to make it to comply for the saas business as well the software as a service so fundamental differentiation data as a service works on the third party data and the saas business is customers first party data now first and foremost uh um, just to reposition this at 2017 now i know there are very specialized companies which are talking about data catalog and you have forrester waves and gartner g2 references all these things but in 2017 fortunately there were one or two uh, open source data catalogs not very uh, mature um so we ended up building something um, which which was helping us achieve our use cases internally so on the right hand side i have put the tech stack on which we have built we built it over plain rdbms and elastic search uh, it was a microservice and a library and it had capabilities around registration onboarding and updates during processing and we had a extension um, it evolved to accommodate a couple of metrics like the quality metrics and what are the verification semantics which can be added and the last thing is we have evolved the catalog where it could be reused to a saas component where people can bring in their own catalog as well so this is this is kind of the journey and the initial tech stack looks like what i have put in the right hand side coming to what why you need a catalog thing is if you are doing anything in compliance you have to invest in some level of data asset inventory control so that is something very very fundamental if you're taking undertaking any compliance journey be it if you want to go for a iso certification or any other certification or you want to comply your data to uh, the data production bill ccp gdpr or anything hipaa or anything you you need to invest on this so couple of basic things where it starts is where does your data come from right who gives the data what is a partner which is the region it is coming from what are the categories of data data categories could be myriad even if it's a people centric data it could be something like your demographics or their interest and intent or the apps they are using in their mobile 
or their browsing history or their healthcare. So the sensitivities of each of these data is going to be different. So you need to understand what is the data category which is coming into. And second thing is pretty obvious if you forget about compliance, even if you want to run a data pipeline system in an efficient manner, you need to know what the data contains. You cannot blindly run any data. So you need to know the schema, you need to know what is the field types and what is the cardinality. Cardinality is the number of values a particular field can take. Say, for example, if it's a gender, it could be a three cardinality item. But whereas if it is a zip code or a geolocation, it is a very, very high cardinality item. So that is the thing. And you need to have some level of expected values. Say, for example, uh, if, you're, if you're tomorrow, you're bringing in a policy where saying that, I do not want to process any minor data. So you need to restrict your expected values, which, which can act as a validation when the data flows into your system. So these are a couple of things which we had created. And second thing is, how do you describe the data? A couple of data can be raw, a couple of data can be inferred through heuristics or some machine learning pipeline or some analysis which you have given on top of it. You can name it as inferred, calculated attributes, derived attributes, whatever. But you need to know which is the, uh, I, I would say, the, the source of that particular data in terms of whether it, it is in its raw format or it's an inferred format. And the next item is, when did you get this? This, this becomes very important in terms of which data was, suppose you're running a data exchange, you need to know when you have sent the data and which version of the data you have sent. And for that, the time stamping is very, very important. So old school data warehousing people will know that it was always a concept called bi-temporal time stamping, where you had a period of time when the data start valid date and the end valid date of any data point. So that is very much relevant even in current scenario, if you're running some sort of data exchange systems within, within the company, right? The version and this thing. Of course, there are again in versioning, you have stellar tools like DBT and all these things, which is, which is just bringing a GitHub style of semantics into the data as well, right? Now, where this data point came from, this is something very unique to Zeotap. Uh, the reason is why we wanted to invest in lineage. In, even before the compliance, we had a unique problem where we have like 100 plus data partners who are giving us uh, data or who are contributing to a knowledge of a specific user. So for example, one data partner knows about his intent. Another data partner knows only about his demographics. And we need to know which data partner contributed to the knowledge because downstream, when we use the data, we need to give back attribution back to that particular source of knowledge. So that is why lineage became important to us. Second part of the lineage is a conflict resolution. So one data partner can say that this particular user is a male based on some uh, derivation strategies they have, or direct mapping strategy. It could be probabilistic or deterministic. Another data partner, whereas says this is a female. Now, what exactly is the correct answer? So that is one conflict resolution semantics. And this 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 has a whole uh, uh, machine learned pipeline behind the scenes in terms of how it is operating and how we are attributing this. And uh, and it it has a sort of priority queue within the system where we give compliance the top priority. Say, for example, a data partner, potentially in my data science pipeline, could be a very low quality data partner due to various aspects. So it is, it's a moving spectrum due to various aspects. But he is still saying this particular user is age 16 years. And whereas all the other high quality data partners are saying he's 21. As per compliance, rules i am not i have decided i won't process any minor data for my third party in which case i don't care even if it is a low quality data partner i give the priority to the compliance and i just nuke the data when it comes in right i just block it at the first level it doesn't move beyond into that system so this is the thing an attribute level is pretty obvious we need to know at each attribute which who has contributed to this particular piece of attribute so as i mentioned one can give int another can give interest so this is about the data catalog and lineage system which was built then the evolution this is something say 
it's it's a, it's a evolving story. When I talk about the SaaS, uh, this all will fall into play in terms of why this this evolved into this. So this could be taken as a evolution for any data catalog as well. So the basically what you start with is in terms of what are my data assets and what is the schema, uh, what it contains. Right? Second comes lineage. Lineage may not be a priority for all the companies, but slowly uh, with um, uh, I, I would say the governance rules and everything picking up, the lineage is becoming a very important thing. And raw or inferred, I just talked about, whether it's raw or inferred. Then the third is where it is stored, right? So the, the, the data can be stored in multiple loca locations based on its version. You could have one copy of the data in your data lake, another copy in a HBase data system, and another truncated copy version version three of that in a, in a very fast lookup store so you need to know if a data asset is available whether it's split and stored across various places so where all it is stored becomes a very important thing then comes the higher order problems what purpose you are using the data for you might have mapped these purposes up front so so there are two aspects to it internally you might be having the purpose in uh, various manners you could say this is for analytics exclusively for management reporting, or you could use it for analytics, main for management reporting and market, my marketing team. And third could be the purpose is like this, this purpose is mainly for billing my customers. So you need to understand each of your data assets, what is the purpose of its usage? Reason purpose becomes important. You need to backtrack it when it comes to um, the consent and the preference management system. You need to have some kind of connectivity in terms of okay this is the, uh, the the data is currently used in all these purposes probably down the line when the consent flows in i need to cross check these two purposes and then figure out okay can i really use the data or not then then the next is who owns it right who owns it is uh, th that could be multiple ownership right so that will be always a creator of the data and who owns the data ultimately the customer is the owner as per any of the government regulation the customer is the real owner of the data so this ownership is within your organization who has access to what data point and this owner has an additional responsibility of assigning correct roles say for example if i am the sales department this is also in line with the data mesh architecture which many organizations are moving to if i am running the sales department i take ownership saying all this sales data is mine and this is the customer data attached to my sales data and i give this access i approve this access for the marketing team or i approve this access for the finance team so this is called the who owns it concept the ownership concept itself it will take a little more time but largely i think this this should help in understanding of what is the ownership of a data within the organization then the uses is who uses it is a separate this thing now that can be controlled by the access control systems by the role based access control systems and the last thing which is very important which is uh, i i'd say one of the highest level of evolution if you can achieve it even even within zootab this is achieved in bits and parts in terms of the you know, we have various rules helping it out but it is not like a combined holistic system where i could go into a metadata system and i have all the data assets and i am able to take a single window saying that okay this is the rules and these are the rules which is governing the data right so this is what are the rules which govern all the uh, i would say thousands of data assets which could be strewn across your organization so this is a, I would say, evolutionary approach in terms of how the data catalog is evolving. And there are some fantastic companies which are investing in these areas and giving you out-of-the-box tools now to achieve this as well. Now, within Zotap, what we did, we spent time on how we manage the policies. So policy is nothing but a rule in terms of, say, there is a rule which says if a schema um, is supposed to send me in SHA 256 and it is not coming in that particular format. I say drop that, right? Drop that data set, right? Because I, I just took a sample of 10 items and I'm just dropping that. So that is an action what we're doing, right? Now, um, so the policy is tells me what exactly I need to look out and action is what I need to do based on the policy evaluation. So this is how we had structured the system and the policy types can operate. So when I say policy on which 
uh, granularity it operates. So it could be a schema level granularity, which applies for the complete data asset, and it could be a value, each value level granularity as well. And the retention policy is something which, which can operate on the, again, on the data asset as well. So this is the thing. And actions, we had a couple of out of the box uh, actions like drop the data, you need to alert it, and you need to nullify the data. It means it's, it's a, uh, we didn't have masking for the data as a service at that time uh, in terms of our use cases. So we used to just nullify it because we didn't want that data in any, any, any way. And we also added some sort of hierarchy support in the sense if this policy is there, also check for this policy. And if this action is taken, also do, the, do for this action. So this is more like a, many, I would say, architects can cleanly understand why this separation is done and why the hierarchy and how these things are done. So it, it derives from basic design principles of a system design. And these things are, the right hand things are going to come back again and again, RDBMS, Elasticsearch, which was again powering this microservices and libraries or uh, most of our libraries we currently have a library on golang and uh, java and scala as well uh, most of the data pipelines on scala backend services on java and golang so that is where we have spent these libraries on and uh, uh, for changing the policies and actions i'll come in the next slide we had created apis the crud apis for the domain experts this could be your uh, legal people who see a change in the regulations and they want to change something and even the product experts who want to change some things. Um, in the ta tabulation, I've just given how this is uh, stored, the, how the policy management is more or less stored, right? So we have the, uh, it, it just gives you a relation between the various items here. Now, coming to the compliance catalog, why, why, why you have a policy. Now, what is this compliance catalog? Nothing. So compliance is the final granularity in the policy. So uh, any functional programming expert can immediately understand what I'm talking about here. So the compliance is the runtime parameter. And you, remember, compliance has three dimensions to it. It has a vertical dimension. It has an organizational dimension. It also has your regulatory dimension. So whether it is GDPR or CCPA. GDPR might say that you need to do something within 72 hours, whereas uh, Data Protection Bill India might say it is 48 hours. So that becomes kind of a runtime parameter or a threshold. Uh, if you look at GDPR, the sensitive list is different. And uh, PDP, the sensitive, uh, or rather PDP, let me call it Data Protection Bill, which is the current name. It is a little sensitive, different list. So the blacklist, white list changes. How do you accommodate your system for this extensibility, right? That is why we have a separate catalog for this whole compliance as well. So what I have put in that point three there is this F of policy, that's a function of policy and the function of the parameter which is added will give you what is the action to be actuated on this. And I just gave an example of the blacklist, how it looks like, right? So for data as a uh, service, the IP address becomes a blacklist. Anything with ethnicity becomes a blacklist. Anything with religion becomes a blacklist. We don't do process any of this for the third-party data assets. Now, what do we mean by uh, use of backend and UA as well? So this device underscore IP address, just giving example, we don't process it. This may not mean anything for a person who is looking it on top of UI, right? So he needs to understand it in a better parlance. So for him, uh, IP address uh, of the user or something, some better terminology might be different, might be good to explain him what exactly it is, right? So that is why I mentioned that this also has an extension towards creating your own catalog, which, which helped us a lot in terms of our uh, SaaS business as well downstream. So this is largely about the compliance catalog. We talked about policy, we talked about data catalog and the lineage, then the policy management, the compliance catalog. Now this all plays together to give the compliance processing. So whatever I have talked about here is more or less your governance layer. Of course, governance could have multiple other things in terms of the access control, as we saw in the um, evolution of the catalog. But largely, the governance system uh, under the umbrella of the governance, we are storing data catalog, the policy store, compliance catalog. This path is, um, I would say, it was a bit unique to us, but now given many of the data processing pipelines are going more and more event driven, this is again reusable for anything. So the path catalog is nothing but a 
repository of uh, registered paths where the data can come and land, the data asset can come and land, and which is going to be a trigger for the downstream processing. So since it's event-driven, it also fell into the same governance, not since it was event-driven, since it was uh, linked to the data asset, which we are operating on, it fell under the governance bucket itself. The conflict service, um, you could debate whether it needs to be under governance, but for us, we just put it under governance because we wanted to, um, I would say, also govern what is the configurations we are giving. So when I say configurations, it, you might be running a Spark processor. In our case, it's Spark processor or tomorrow a Flink processor or a basic Kubernetes cluster on which you're operating your data pipeline, right? So what is the configs you want to inject into the system? So that is what um, it, it's mainly the processing configurations which, which we had here. Now, how exactly the processing pipeline works? Any data set from the path catalog, the trigger happens, it comes in. This, go, this system injects what is a schema level policy. Now, the schema level policy is operating on the whole data asset. It processes it, takes a particular action. Then it spews a couple of audit logs based on the action which has taken. Then it iterates on each of the data points within the data asset where the value level policy is going to be actuated. So the processing of the each record with the value level policy policy again the actions are taken audit is spewed in the end you get a compliant data set so this is a spark pipeline which we have downstream used for some other pipelines as well as similar semantics just the processing layer has been different but here what i'm showcasing is primarily the spark pipeline coming to the next item the deletion or the opt-out uh, is something needs a separate treatment because the data deletion as i mentioned it could be the data asset could be in multiple places uh, say it could be in your hot store it could be in your archival store it could be in your uh, the basic data lake so if it's in the data lake you need to ensure that this deletion is much more transactional in nature so that you could call yourself complaint saying if somebody has done an opt-out we have done the opt-out as well Okay, so uh, just forget about this right hand side. I just added a slide for later, but it is, I feel I missed deleting it, but we'll just concentrate on the left hand side. This is more from the data as a service business angle, what was happening. So, Zeotab had three different sources of getting the opt out or the consent data. One is the global or the Zeotab. So, we have a website. We have an uh, app store, um, iOS and Android app store items uh, via which a customer can go and give an opt-out signal. Second thing is our data partners who are giving data to our systems, they can send the opt-out list. Third is the consumers where we send data to the particular system. So we send to approximately 70 odd systems at this point in time, including the Facebooks and Googles and all these things. So they can come and tell, oh, I don't need to process this particular data. So these are the three sources where which the opt-out data comes into Zeotap's systems. And as I mentioned, the global opt -out, let me come to the global opt -out. the privacy app, we have a privacy app and a website. This is a classic backend API architecture where all these opt out data goes in. And mind you, with GDPR, we have up to 72 hours to comply to go and delete across all these systems. Um, from data partners and consumers, it is uh, similar to ingestion mechanism. It could be a cloud exchange. We also get, give an API. And for some data partners, we also host a SFTP via which they are able to send this on a, say, daily frequency, which, which we are getting it. So it is something similar to data ingestion, the opt-out uh, data which comes into play. And as I mentioned, the handling is very important. How we have done here, let me explain. Global means we have got an opt-out signal from the Zeotap website or the privacy app. That means I cannot have that user anymore across any of my data assets. So I just go and do a blanket nuke of that particular user. Partner level means 
I have 100 data partners. Two data partners are saying this user has opted himself out of my systems. If you remember, we have already created a lineage system. So we know this particular data partner's data, where all it is percolated. So we just go and nuke only those assets, which, which has come from that data partner. We don't nuke the entire user. The entire user nuke will happen. Suppose if he's the only person who has given that data. So obviously in that case, the user will go away. But if, if the signal has come from four data partners, only two has opted out, the two would be remaining, two would be taken off. And consumer level operates in a similar manner. It's just, it is coming from the left hand, um, right hand side of the equation. The consumer says, I cannot consume this user's data anymore. That means we filter it out before pushing the data to that consumer. So I, uh, as I mentioned, there could be consumer A, B, and C. C says this user has opted out of my system. That means A and B still receive the data, but C, it is not receiving. So this is these all rules driven in terms of how the um, flow uh, works downstream. But these are the three kind of handling. And how do we handle it? So this is where the whole consent mastered object, the preference and consent object, uh, mastered object comes into play, right? So it, it has the purpose and the IDs, and it has all these meta information of what has happened to that particular thing, unless it's a global level. For a global level, there is nothing like a um, orchestration semantics. It's just plain deletion semantics for that, where, where this consent object goes and it says ID global. That means it whenever it the next all the data processing pipelines happen they'll check this all consent mastered ids and they just nuke it from all my data assets and tcf is a specific framework which was created by the iab which is the ad tech uh, consortium and we adhere to that because our primary business was on ad tech i'll skip that right hand side that is for the SaaS thing what was the changes made now coming to the consent data flow uh, this is not a sample, this is a production of the data as a service. So as I mentioned, you have the various data partners and you have the global consent. First thing is I need to enrich the IDs. From, a, uh, from the DAS business perspective, my IDs were primarily the mobile identifiers, which is cookies and mobile IDs. Then you have the email and the phone number hashes. So we had to cross-link all these identifiers so that we know, say data partner A might be just giving MA IDs and some kind of opt-out information. Whereas in GeoTab, this fellow would have come and um, given his email ID and told opt me out. So I need to have this linkages between these various IDs. I'm not going to talk about how the whole entire linkage semantics is going to work here, but this ID enrichment is more like ID linkage creation, which is, which is happening within GeoTab for our it's it's one of our primary businesses so that happens there and we standardize the format of this whole consent data and we create two things one is the consent object which is mainly used for the deletion as i mentioned so the deletion it is like blanket you just need to go and say that okay globally delete or delete for these particular data partners and this thing and the second thing is if i have to if you remember there is a third scenario where in processing i need to take care of not pushing out certain data to certain consumers. So that is where the processing semantics come into play. So you have this, that is that is more like a tag in terms of, okay, uh, this consumer, these set of IDs can be tagged, not tagged, or say, uh, do send, do not send kind of a very simple yes, no kind of tag, which is, which is used by the consent processing lib. And it goes on. And all this consent data object is stored. And there is a historical ar archive as well, uh, except in terms of a global org. So this is how the data sample works. And coming to the other major requ requirement of GDPR, if you remember, they, the user has the management, which is all a right to clauses. You will see what is the user's right to erasure, user right to uh, ask for the data, user right to forget. And th there are a bunch of things, even the data production will, these things are coming out. So for us, from the data service perspective, the primary identifiers were the MIDs, cookies, hash email, and hash phone number. Same architecture as how we are using for the opt-out API collection. We use we, we just expanded that application to give the API layer. And uh, the website and mobile apps are available where which any user can go and check for this data and exercise his user rights. Um, because there could be a heavy inflow of 
uh, check whether my user data is available and stuff like that. We use Bloom's heavily. It's a, just a, I'll, I'm alluding to the tech stack what we have used. We have used Bloom's a lot. And all the identifiers across ZeroTap, there is a fast lookup DB available for quick access of this particular user access management. If you think about it, this is more like a transaction thingy where I need to respond to the user as quickly as possible whenever he asks. It. So it is being served by a fast lookup DB at this point in time. And uh, the assets and other things, of course, with the ID asset, which is uh, which will be processed with the profile asset and other things, would be taken care of the downstream processing pipelines. That is, that is an internal flows. Coming to a very important thing, uh, this is something which which immensely helped us in terms of uh, say creating even some audit artifacts, right? When we were running for the ISO certification and other things. What we decided is we will use a common format uh, of audit log. And the format should be as simple as say you are able to uh, load it as an external table in any of your BQ or Athena or whatever, and you're able to run your queries. So we developed libraries for distributed systems like Spark, as well as for all the microservices which is running that, which I was having any, any sort of uh, this data asset management of any sort, they will be using this particular log semantics. And all the logs, um, wherever from a distributed pipeline, if you go to it, it goes to the YARN and it goes to uh, say a PubSub or a Kafka and it, at the end it flows into a S3. So, and even from, uh, since it's GCS now, we are, we are not no more in S3 anymore, but at that time it was in S3, now it's all in GCS. Um, a couple of log grammars, which I have put as examples here, is like, what is a violation type, which could be there, and which is the product. We have a bunch of products in ZeroTap. So what is a product code and which flow in the, which stage in the data flow uh, did this violation happen? What is the action we took? And what is the timestamp of the action? And when the violation was fine and when the um, action was taken, right? So there could be a difference between, because everything has a, uh, some sort of delay could be available before we the data set could have come to you, uh, say today morning, but your action had taken only in the afternoon. So that means a violation had technically happened as soon as the data came into your system. So, but you took the action here, and then you say the violation was identified at this point, and the action was taken at this point. And it had a couple of other metadata as well, which is all new, uh, which I don't remember off my head, but a bulk of other metadata available along with the rocks. And we had defined a proper grammar on which we could, as I told, run a SQL query on top of it once it was loaded as an external table. And when I when we put this all together, this is how my data as a service pipeline looks like uh, from a compliance perspective. So if you look at it, the central is the compliance services. And what I have put on the right-hand side are the various different products which is running their own data pipeline. So we have a targeting product for our tech, connect product again for our tech, insight for um, audience planning. So these all these consume this compliance services. And same on the left-hand side is all my ingestion pipelines where, where data is flowing into my system towards my storages. And uh, the, the right-hand side, those all data uh, driven applications, which is which is written on top of this, um, you could you could just correlate to the initial slide where I showed the logical model compliant uh, the processing layer and the storage layer in terms of if you look at it the storage the policy and the rules are being uh, in the storage layer then the compliant services all the process the TTL process compliance process alerting process which are orchestrated using a compliance workflow manager is there. Then for the global opt-out, you have the mobile app and the web app. Then you have a bunch of API layers helping it, um, say internal APIs for the admins, as well as external APIs for the end users. Um, the, the catalog, you have the audit management and the user data services, the various microservices, which is helping it, right? So this is a bit, um, I would say this architecture has been as is since uh, 2017, where 2018 was the first release, there have been a couple of iterations, but largely it, it has remained the same. So that was the whole, the product which we put together from a GDPR and compliance perspective um, for, within ZeroTap to achieve all these things together. 
Uh, going forward, there is uh, other important aspects. As I told, just these processors is not one end of the story. You need to have a good amount of uh, infra items and security items as well within your systems to be um, to to be adhering to the compliance. If you remember in the part one, I had shown a circle in terms of the security aspect, uh, the governance aspect, and the privacy aspect, like a full circle going around. So this comes from the cyber security and other aspects. One important thing: data so sovereignty. It, it has to be done by infra. Nobody else can give it to you, right? You cannot do any kind of compliance processing or any opt out processing to achieve uh, data sovereignty. So, suppose at least with ZeroTap, EU data remains within EU. There is no cross border data transfer. We have just taken a decision um, in terms of we will never do any cross border uh, data transfer. So, the data sovereignty is completely um, within EU itself. Whatever EU data, it is in EU. US data, it is going to be in US. Then access and right control, this is a huge topic. Um, go over what is zero trust security and principle of least privileges. These are heavily used. Uh, many of the access to the production systems, it is on a based on a uh, system where we give a three hour access for anybody to debug and stuff like that. So the, it, it's, it's like a, the, the, this, the InfoSec team can really help in terms of how to actuate it, but you need help of your infra and security teams to put it, execute it on the ground. And a couple of other things, the ID and profile data set is always separated. This is mainly to ensure there is a minimum blast radius in the sense somebody has inadvertent access to your ID, they still don't have access to their profile data asset, which is which. And if you have profile data asset, they don't have the ID data asset so that they, they can link it and really figure out whose profile this is, right? There is a in between anonymous ID, which which only programmatically is your tap resolves in terms of combining these two identifiers. So this was again a architectural decision which we had taken uh, one from a compliance perspective and also from an overall manageability uh, perspective of the data assets as well. And all profile data is it's not exactly pseudonymous. It is a random ID, which is actually it is if you if you take the profile data in its own the ID which is there is it's a, it's a random ID. Uh, so pseudonymization. I need to correct the term. It is an anonymized ID which is sitting with the profile data. The all the other ID which has linkability directly to the user is sitting in a separate store. And for the data as a service, the third party data as a service, ZeroTap accepts only hashed email and phone numbers. We don't take raw email ID or phone numbers. And if some partner is planning to give, what we do is at the first step from the raw and landing zone, we just convert it to this particular format and downstream processing, everything happens there. And that, that asset is cleared off once that is done. So it, it, it has a very small lifetime of uh, when this conversion happens, right? Say, and Conversion of an email, a million email to hash format is hardly a half an hour to one hour exercise in any cloud system. So that is that is where it is. And with that, I'll just um, move on to the reusability of SaaS in the part three of the talk and also reusability of the assets which we have uh, created for GDPR for the upcoming PDP or the data protection. I keep repeating PDP. So it is a data protection bill now. So for the data protection bill as well. Uh, 